that was, that was, there was some energy in that one. I like it. All right. If you have kids with you, we, each week we tell you we love to have your kids stay with you and learn with you. We value that here. I think your kids worshiping with you, learning with you is a good thing, but some of you prefer a classroom, and if you prefer that, your kids can go now. If your kids are staying and they want the worship handout, just let us know. I think I'll draft Pastor Amaudi, Pastor John, they'll help you get that. If, all right, John just left. All right, so Pastor Amaudi will help you totally. If you need one of those handouts for your kids, let me know, or just kind of slip your hand up and Pastor Amaudi will come to you, because Pastor Amaudi is just that kind of guy. All right. For the rest of us, Revelation chapter 12, and if you need a Bible, there's one on the chairs in front of you, you can open up to Revelation chapter 12. In fact, if you need help finding that, it's on page 1034, and you can turn there. So last week I started with uh, a promise that begins Scripture. Scripture begins with this promise made by God, and I'm going to put it on the screen, I'm just going to walk through how it goes. So God creates humanity, humanity sins, and then this, right? Genesis 3, verses 14 and 15. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, I put enmity between you and the woman, between her offspring, your offspring and her offspring. He, notice it's he, talking about Jesus here, God promises Jesus to come. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Another way of saying that, another translation says, you will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. Right? And this is the promise that evil and humanity, that, that Satan and, and evil will contend with humanity all throughout humanity's life, and that the offspring of the woman, probably more importantly, those who follow God, the, the offspring of fallen humanity who are redeemed through God, will be plagued by evil, right? and that there will be this contention all the days of our life. And then this promise of Jesus, he will crush your head. Even though you'll bruise his heel, he'll crush your head. He'll bruise your head. The next verse says this in verse 16. He says, to the woman God said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband and he will rule over you. There will be struggle in childbirth, pain, and there will be struggle in marriage, this contention, right? Now we all know that marriage is good. We love marriage. We also know it's two selfish and sinful people getting together for a lifetime, and therein lies the problem. Except for me, of course. My wife's perfect, because <laughs> she's here. So, all right. The next two verses, God says to Adam, this is in 17 through 19, three verses. And, Adam, and, and to Adam, God said, because you have sinned, cursed is the ground because of you, and pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you were dust, and to dust you shall return. Part of the deal, because of sin in human history, is that we will all die. We will return to the ground. So part of the curse is you will contend with evil, there will be struggles in life, until you return to the ground. So when do those struggles end? We return to the ground, right? Then why... Why do we fear death so much? If you're in Christ, and you know that eternity is secure for you, and if death ends this current struggle with evil, why are we so resistant? Not, I'm not saying run headlong into it. We're not that. But understand that our fears or our desires for this world keep us from an understanding that actually death ends that struggle with evil. So here's a main idea for you. Satan contends with humanity until death. Final victory comes when we conquer this life and our physical bodies are laid to rest. Burial is not final, nor is death a defeat, but it is victory because of Christ. If you die in Christ, death doesn't have the last word. All throughout Revelation, God has been saying, blessed are those who, have, who, who don't have to endure the second death, right? Or on the, on the opposite side says, woe to those who will suffer the second death, right? That's been a, a theme throughout Revelation, that there will be this contention between those who follow God and, and the evil that would, that, would, that would persecute them and that would oppose them, but that this life is temporary and that this struggle is lifelong, that it, it won't go away until the end of all things. 
but that we have a purpose while we're here. That we as the church have a purpose of being light in a dark world. And so that we endure and that we conquer or overcome this world by enduring in Christ. And that when death comes, death comes. Death of this physical body means the end of this sinful and broken world for us. And if we make it all the way until Jesus fully returns, then, then we also lose this body and gain eternity. So Revelation chapter 12, starting in verse 1. It says this, And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. So the setting here, the context for today is heaven. We're, we're starting up in heaven. We've been talking about this a lot, that Revelation gives us these multiple views, and we've categorized two sets of views. One we'll call the upper story, where it's kind of looking from God's perspective. We see kind of the divine story, what God is doing in human history or throughout human history. And then we see the lower story, the, the human story, where we are. Sometimes all that we can see is this. And so John is getting this, our author John is getting this kind of dual look at the story, at human history, at redemptive history throughout humanity. Right, when I say redemptive history, to how the gospel has played itself out over time, right? And how people then engage with God through the gospel. And so sometimes when we see things going on here, hardship, persecution, suffering, tribulation, enduring here, what we see is a perspective change from God's perspective, what God is doing in the midst of that. And so we get these kind of dual stories, the upper story and the lower story. And so today, we begin in that upper story. We begin in heaven, and John sees a sign. It says, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet with a crown of 12 stars. And the woman here is the people of God. And this passage in, Roman, in Revelation 12 is going to take us all the way back to the image in the garden. And just as Eve represents all of life, just as she is the mother of all humanity, as well as she is redeemed by God after sin, covered by God. God makes the first sacrifice, covers her, covers her sin, covers her with clothing too, right? And then promises that through her will come Jesus, right? That the offspring of her, a he, not just anyone, but he will crush Satan's head. So she's the mother of all the living. She's also the mother of all the faithful, She's also the mother of sin, too, right? Like, there's a lot going on here. But this woman in Genesis is the woman in Revelation 12. And it's going all the way back to the garden promises. The imagery from the garden played out now. We see a woman in heaven, clothed with sun, standing on the moon, a crown of 12 stars. And this woman is going to show us, or is going to, is going to be the image we're going to see throughout Revelation 12. So verse 12, verse 2. She was pregnant, was crying out in birth pains, and the agony of giving birth. So again, there are allusions back to Genesis 3. Crying out in birth pains. Remember the curse over humanity, right? That women will struggle in childbirth. There, was pain, there is pain associated with childbirth. Ladies, you can speak to that far greater than I can, right? I just look like I can speak to it. Don't know what it was supposed to be like. But I know I've seen animals give birth and other things, and it doesn't seem as painful. And, and I just imagine maybe things were easier before sin. I don't know, right? I don't know the intention. I know what God has told us, that there will be pain in childbearing. And so this woman is now agonizing about childbirth. And it's pointing us forward to the he, the promise of childbirth, that the offspring of the woman will come and have victory over Satan. And that she is in labor, she's ready to give birth, and it's painful, but is looking forward to the offspring. So verse 3, and it says, And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. Diadems are crowns. And so we have a, a dragon that appears. There's a woman and a dragon. Because I'm not very creative. That's the title of the sermon today. The woman and the dragon. I'm so good at this. Yeah, okay. So it's 
So the dragon, now this is written, this chapter especially, is written in this mythological language. Now myth doesn't mean it's untrue, it's using mythological language, right? A dragon, a beast, clearly something where, you know, to understand is evil and bad and, and powerful. And the woman obviously is representing not only a woman, but, but all of God's people that are awaiting or believe in a savior. And so we see this woman with imagery around her. And we see this great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads are seven diadems or seven crowns, and the, the horns and the, the sevens and the tens, all that stuff is really meant to show kind of a mocking or a parody of Jesus, that the dragon is kind of mocking and parodying, parodying making fun of Jesus, I can say that. Right, that the, the seven heads and, and, and the, the ten horns, ten horns are about authority and power, or more about power, horns all throughout scripture about power. And then the crowns about rulership or royalty or authority, right? And there's this, this image of kind of the dragon, the beast that is mocking, that is pretending to be or parroting Jesus. So we have this woman. And this dragon, verse 4, and it says, his, twelve swept, his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. And so a third of the stars kind of reminds us of the story of how Satan had those who followed him and, and led a rebellion and, and, was, and was defeated, right? And that there is this contention between good and evil, and again, the one-third doesn't have to be a literal thing. When we were looking at the seals and at the trumpets, we saw that one-third is used as kind of this partial destruction or partial something not complete. Because though some follow Satan, most do not. It, it's got that feel to it. And so there, we see this contention between good and evil. It says the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore the child, he might devour it. And again, we're back to Genesis 3 we know that God has spoken this promise, and he said it actually directly to Satan, right? He said it in the presence of humanity, but the promise is not, hey, I'm going to promise and bring a savior. I'm going to promise to bring someone who crushes you. That's what God ultimately says. Yes, for the redemption of humanity, but the promise is, I'm kicking your butt for this one, right? Like, I win this fight. You get that, right? And that's what God says, and that's obviously my paraphrase, it's really from the Greek, but you know, so God is keeping his promise to come and have victory. God is keeping his promise to come and have, have defeat over Satan. And so Satan we see as this dragon, this image waiting on the child to be born. He wants to devour it. He'd like to get rid of the problem before the problem grows up to beat him, right? That's the idea. So Genesis 3 is this backdrop, and the, the climax of this story is coming into focus, that the birth of Jesus is nearing. And, and again, this helps us understand Revelation in its entirety. Revelation isn't written about future, right? In fact, at this point, we've backed all the way up to the beginning of Scripture, to Genesis. And right now, we're awaiting the birth of Christ, right, 2,000 years ago. And that Revelation was never intended to be read as either future or linear, right? Are these snapshots of redemptive history, sometimes from a divine perspective, sometimes looking at the entirety of human life, sometimes from the lower story, looking at from the gospel forward, sometimes other settings. But it's being written to these seven churches who are really alive at that moment who are enduring persecution, and God has given Jesus a message. He's delivered through an angel to his servant, John, who is writing to these seven churches. And to these seven churches, he reminds them, conquer, to overcome this world, to endure tribulation in this life is the purpose of the church. That It's not just purposeful that we endure it, but that we endure it so that light can shine in a dark world. So we endure hard things. So we are willing to suffer. We are willing to take on the struggle in this life so that others can know Jesus. Knowing that this life is short, knowing that this life will end, but on the other side of that is forever, apart from pain and apart from tears and apart from illness and apart from death. 
and that we want others to know that, and so we are willing to endure here. And so the story unfolds, and now as we look at the dragon waiting to devour the child, we remember the promises of Genesis 3. So here's a note for you. There are some partial and temporary victories that provide hope in the gospel. Satan is shown to win in small ways. Some angels follow him, but most do not. We may suffer temporarily, but we have victory eternally. Satan is ultimately defeated. We should be happier about that. Satan is ultimately defeated. Okay, better. All right, good. Evil loses, right? The pain in my back goes away, right? Illness goes away. Death goes away. Hardship, struggle goes away if we are in Christ. That Christ has had victory over Satan. That that victory is given to us and that victory is what we call both now and not yet. It is true now and it is more fully true later, right? That it is now is also fully true later, a now and a not yet. So verse 5, she gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. So a male child, the offspring of the woman promised way back in Genesis 3, is now born right? The woman gave birth to a child. This child is to rule the nations, right? That he is the promised one to rule over everything. So the gospel she gave birth to, Jesus, it's the very message, if you will, of Christmas, that that God became flesh in human form, that Jesus becomes like us so that we can become sons and daughters of God, that he enters into human history into the story that you and I live. And he does so to live like us, to live with us, but to overcome this world, to live without sin, to live in our place. So restart, let's, re- let's reread verse five. She gave birth to a male child, one who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne. This caught up to God, caught up to, is this language that's repeated throughout Revelation that this John is caught up into this story and that Jesus is caught up to God here and that we get caught up into. And it's this reminder that, that Jesus has ascended and had victory over. Right now, it's not just Jesus entering into our story that saves us. And it's not just Jesus dying on a cross that forgives us, though it does. And it's not even just the resurrection. I hate to say just the resurrection. But the resurrection that gives us new life. It's not just that. Jesus ascends back to heaven showing victory over Satan. That his job here, the accomplishment of redemption, is complete. That he can go back and sit on his throne. He was made to rule over the nations, it says, with a, with a, a scepter or a rod of iron. This is fulfilling a promise all the way back in Psalm 2. We'll put this on the screen. The psalmist says, The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I've begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. That the promise that God has repeated throughout time, first over Satan, to the people of God, to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the man who becomes Israel, through his lineage, one of his sons named Judah, on through the people of God that wander out into the desert as they set up into their own nation. God raises up a king for them. God reiterates this promise to his king, David, as David wants to do for God. And God says, you don't do for me, I do for you. But because your heart's in the right place, I will give you a son who will sit on the throne forever looking forward to Jesus. That God in Christ keeps his promises throughout human history, the very promise that we live and breathe in, the gospel power to transform our lives. So here's a note to you, victory in the ascension. The victory over Satan doesn't just happen at the resurrection, but ultimately in the ascension of Jesus to the throne. Revelation 12, 5, the verse we just read, is the key to victory to the rest of Revelation 12. Jesus is shown victorious over all. This verse sets the stage for the rest of the chapter. 
that this victory is derived from this verse, the Jesus who entered human flesh and then ascended to the throne, that that sets up the victory for the rest of 12. So let's start, verse 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days. And again, we have, have not taken the numbers to be literal things. They don't work out that way. We've taken the numbers, just as it said in the beginning that this church would just suffer for 10 days. We know, okay, you're going to suffer for a short time. Or there's wandered off into a wilderness to be nourished for 1260 days. We're not worried about that being literal 1260 days. It's giving this idea of a time period, right? That, okay, this is, I mean, it's a long time, but it's not that bad. It, it, it's this, it's short, it's endurable, right? And so the numbers, just like the imagery, like the dragon, like we don't really think Satan looks like a dragon, nor that he has seven heads, like that's an image to give us something. Well, so are the numbers to teach us, to give us more of a feel for something than they are an accurate account of something. It's written in apocalyptic genre, meaning heavily image-driven, that the illustrations are drawn for us so we would understand something more than try and count out days. So the woman is led into the wilderness, right? The woman is the church living between the ascension and the return of Jesus, and the wilderness is this. See, here's the problem. We forget that we're in the wilderness. Right? This pushes us all the way back to the deliverance of slaves out of Egypt. As they were pushed into the desert, the wilderness, where they spent 40 years. With a promise and a reminder that their future was in another place. That they would eventually enter in and inherit a land of their own. But until then, they were wanderers in a desert wilderness. And the gospel message for you and me goes through that desert wilderness that we live in this place, that this is not our home, that we look to an eternal inheritance that is our own. Jesus says, you're not of this world just like I'm not of this world. Right? We are resident aliens in a place that is not our own. But we've lost sight of that. And we place all of our effort here and now, he says he will nourish them for 1,260 days. In other words, there's a plan to care for us for the time spent here, the church here, between Jesus' ascension and his return. Verse 7, now war arose in heaven. Now the now doesn't mean now in chronological order. Again, especially Jewish literature isn't written chronologically like that. Now a war arose in heaven. It's just stating a truth. Now a war rose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, meaning Satan was defeated, and there was no longer any place in them for heaven, in heaven. And again, why I point out that it's not chronological. The dragon and his angels fought back, but were defeated. Well, again, we keep getting pushed back to the ascension of Jesus. Right? That Jesus' ultimate victory on the throne is the victory over Satan. Not only the promise of Christ to come, and not only the life and death and resurrection, but the ascension back to the throne is key to this passage, reminding us that with Jesus seated on the throne, Satan has been defeated. Right? Now, it's not permanent. Well, it's permanent. It's not as it will be permanently right? Again, a now and a not yet. There, Satan is defeated now and yet more fully defeated to come, right? And, and we'll get into that in future chapters. We'll kind of play that out more. But here it's just kind of high level view reminding us that Satan has been defeated. Verse 9, and the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. And he was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. So the identity of the great dragon is the serpent from Genesis 3. Now, we've been saying that all along, but John says it for us. The red dragon, the great red dragon, that great dragon is the serpent from Genesis 3. It is Satan, the deceiver, right, called the devil. So the Satan and, and his demons are thrown out of heaven and down to earth. And again, so victory and yet not complete, right? It's not that it's incomplete, 
it that it is being completed. Does that make sense? That there will be an ultimate victory and an, opening, an ultimate casting out of even earth. But right now we live in that in between. And the Bible gives us this story of two kingdoms. Right? The kingdom of God and, and the kingdom of Satan here on earth. And that ultimately when we are in Christ, we become a part of the kingdom. Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near or the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, the kingdom of heaven is him. And so he calls us into this repentant way of life that in the gospel that our, our, that our, our drive, our, our life is, living towards, is lived towards repentance, that we are constantly refocusing and turning towards Jesus. And that we do that as we do that, we are living in his kingdom, even here on earth. But that there is the kingdom of the earth, that there is the place where Satan does have reign, does have authority, and it's here. And it's what we miss so much when we, we lose sight of the fact that this is not our home. That this is where we're not to give ourselves to. Because this is not only not ours, but it is Satan's and it will end. And when I say end, that this earth will be made new. Everything ground up, made new forever. But we tie ourselves to this thing that is going away. And that we invest our heart here in this world that is passing. So where do we focus our heart and our attention today? Do we focus it on the kingdom eternal? Or do we focus it here on the very thing that will be destroyed? And it's a reminder for those of us who are in Christ, where do we place all our time and energy and effort and, and money and devotion? Where? Do we save up for this life and, and risk losing everything? Or do we place everything in eternity, knowing it can never be taken. Verse 10, it says, And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of God and the authority of Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before God. I'm going to show you a little bit more of the now and not yet. In theology, we call this an eschatological reality. In other words, a final things reality. And we use the language of now and not yet. So here's the now. Now salvation and power and authority of Christ have come. So now, now Jesus reigns. Now, he says. But listen to the not yet part as well. The accuser of our brothers accuses them day and night. See, so there's still, even though now Jesus reigns, salvation is now, there's still this struggle here on earth with Satan that he is a, the accuser of the church, the deceiver of the church. That he misleads. And so we see this. Now it's true and it will become more fully true over time and ultimately true when Jesus returns and redeems everything. There's the now and the not yet. Like now you are fully forgiven. If you're in Christ, you are fully forgiven and yet not yet perfect, right? You are completed in Christ and yet not complete. You with me? That's called an eschatological reality that now and not yet of the gospel that you have been made perfect, and yet you are not yet perfect. Verse 11, And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. So who are the they? The church. It says they have conquered him, Satan. They have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. How did they conquer they didn't love their lives more than they loved Jesus. That they didn't place their value and their worth and their time and their energy here. That they loved not their lives even unto death, he says. This language of conquering in Revelation happens in almost every chapter. And in the first, uh, well, not chapter one, but in the first, uh, the second and third chapter, every church is called to conquer, called to called to overcome, that there is this idea that in our endurance that we overcome this world, and that that's a part of what we are called to, that nothing that we do can earn our salvation, that we don't work our way to God. That's the beauty of the gospel, that God loves us so much, knows we can't rise up to him, that we would never choose God on our own, so God comes to us, that we could never work our way to God, we could never, we could never achieve holiness. We could never 
earn salvation. And so God comes to us. So God becomes flesh. That's the incarnation that the woman gives birth to a child who becomes human. That God becomes human flesh, that he lives a sinless life, the life you and I are called to live, but choose not to and and fall short of. And then he dies a death in our place, paying for our sin. Resurrection of the grave, ascends to heaven, having victory over Satan's sin and death. And gives us this in the spirit. That if you have responded to Christ, you are in Christ. We know that the very promise of baptism, right? Repent and be baptized. Every one of you, Peter says, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the Spirit. You will receive the Holy Spirit, that you are empowered to live here. Well, if we didn't have struggle here, what do we need power for? Right? That we're going to live in a life that is going to be against us, that Satan will be against us, that Satan would want to stop the church. Why would Satan want to stop the church? Because the church is the thing that's victorious over him. So if he can deceive the church and go, hey, listen, your job is to enjoy this world. Don't worry about heaven. Okay, well, he put you over here. If he can sidetrack you over here, well, then he gets you off. He gets you off track. You no longer shine a light to a dark world. You're no longer enduring for the sake of the gospel. And again, we can never earn salvation, but we can definitely strive to pay our God back. We can definitely lean into doing all that he calls us to out of gratitude. That we would live for Christ every day. And so if you are not a follower of Jesus, that's what it looks like. It looks like laying down your life for him. Because he laid down his life for you. It looks like a response to Jesus. Then it looks like living a life of repentance, meaning daily learning how off track I am and and turning towards Jesus. The good news is there's plenty of grace. I won't say it's bad news, but I will tell you this. You live for another 80 years, you'll still never arrive. You'll never be perfect. But there is plenty of grace. And there's plenty of time for repentance. Repentance. And there's plenty of time to live for Jesus. And the longer we live, the more we endure, the more struggle we endure here on earth, the more we can share Jesus with others. The more we can tell them the story of how transformed we have become, of how God has made an impact in our lives. He says, for they love their lives, they love not their lives even unto death. Let's restart in that verse. Verse 11, and they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb, And by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives, even unto death. Satan is called the deceiver in an earlier verse. And Satan thought that the death of Jesus was a victory for him. Three days later, Jesus showed him how he had victory over Satan. Right? We just celebrated that that Easter message. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming, right? At Friday, Satan looks like he's achieved something. But the resurrection crushes Satan's head. That's the you will bruise his heel, but he will bruise your head, right? He will crush your head. And when Satan thinks he can kill us or or get us off track, he thinks, okay, well, I've won. And yet when we die and are placed in Christ, when we are eternally in the kingdom, we also have victory over Satan. That's not our victory. It's Christ's victory. He he earned it. He did did the work. He did all the heavy lifting. But the deceiver is deceived as well. Just because he tries to deceive and trick you doesn't mean he has, doesn't have the right outcome. Right? He loses. Even though we endure and we struggle, he ultimately loses. So what is our response to this? How, how can we better live our lives in this today that we live in? Verse 12, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you on earth and sea, for the devil has come to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. So how do we respond to the idea of Christ's ultimate victory, but our call to endurance? Well, one, we rejoice. We rejoice because we know the end. And it talks about those in heaven rejoicing. All throughout, we've seen these snapshots of the church in prayer. And at one point, we even heard the prayers of the martyrs crying, How long, O Lord? And his answer is, just a little while longer, I have, still yet to, I have still yet to rescue some of my own. 
And so we remain, but we join in the choir of prayers that go up like a fragrant incense to God, that we endure together as local churches. We, we are called into this community to endure life and, and go through life together, that we can endure together, we can be on the same squad and, and learn and grow together. And so that as life hits, we have someone to turn to. You can't be known by all the Christians in the area, but you can know one another in the room. Can't do life with everybody on the planet, but you can do life with people in the room. And when life can, gets hard and, and, and then you are called to endure, you can lean on the people in the room. So we can rejoice, but we can also be warned. He says, woe to you still on earth. He's like, there's great mourning and distress in front of you on earth. That's okay because the the outcome, the victory, is already achieved. Verse 13, And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. Now, we see the church on the other side of the resurrection and ascension, the people of God remaining as Jesus ascends back to heaven, and Satan pursues the church. He pursues the people of God. Remember this from back in Genesis when he is speaking, and when God is speaking, he says, I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. Right before he says, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Remember the contention that evil and humanity will struggle all the days of our life until death. The church lives under the pursuit of Satan while we're here on earth. And if we're not being physically persecuted like in other nations and other places, Maybe we're asking the question, how are we being persecuted? Well, we're not really being put to death here. That's probably true. And that likely won't happen in our lifetime. It could. It could change tomorrow, I'm sure. But persecuted doesn't just mean unto death. It's really unpopular to hold traditional Christian values in this world, right? Everything pushes against them. For sure, if you make a stand for traditional biblical values, for sure you will get pushback. But there's another caution, there's another warning. This church, this letter, this, this book we call Revelation, written by this apostle named John, is written to these seven churches. And five of the seven of these churches are enduring tribulation, struggle, persecution at the time. Two are not. But the distinction of the two that are not, they're not really living for Jesus. They are being called to repentance because they're not living for Jesus. Maybe there's a caution there that says if we're not enduring some kind of persecution, maybe we're off track. We don't want persecution. We don't want suffering. But if we were really being effective for the kingdom, would there be more fight? And so it's a challenge. It's a question we should ask ourselves. Is the church too distracted? Is the church off track? Is it enough off track where evil isn't too worried about the church here in America? That should concern us. And then we should lean into enduring. So here's a, a note for you. Same lies, same outcomes, right? We believe Satan's lies when we ignore God, focus on this world, and ignore the purpose of the church. When we live for the pleasure of this life, we fall into the same trap as our ancient parents, right? The tactics of Satan in the garden are look at this thing that God said not to do. God's trying to withhold good from you. You really would be better if you had this. And they're like, hmm, it looks good. I should do that. Right? That's where life falls apart. We buy into the same thing today. We treat, it as, we treat life or the things that God has said no to as if our lives would be better with them. We fall into the same trap. God is saying, lay down this life, pursue eternity. That's your best. That's what's best. And yet we push that aside. We're like, nope, I want to work harder here. I want to get my kids in a better college here. I want to buy a bigger house here. I want this, I want that. We lean into here. May we should learn that same lesson. Verse 14, but the woman was given two wings of the great eagle that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. 
Remember, she is nourished for this season, this season between the ascension and the return that she is cared for, provided for. This two wings, if you will. I love, by the way, this connective word in verse 14, but the woman was given, right? After all of this, what Satan will do after the, after, here's what the church will endure, but this huge transition with the woman was given the two wings of a great eagle. And again, this calls us back to the story of Exodus. When God is speaking to the people in the desert, and we'll put this up in Exodus 19, it says, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasure to possession among all the peoples, for the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. See, remember this conditional promise we talked about last week that was made to the nation Israel. Before they entered their land, he says, here's the deal. I've already promised to bring a savior. That's the big meta narrative of the Old Testament. That's the big story that the entire Old Testament is tracing throughout history and finishes with where's the Messiah? The New Testament opens up with the birth of Christ. But there's other, this subplot, this sub story that people begin to follow the God who made that promise. And they begin to build a community. And eventually they're a large community, a large family. They become a nation. They inherit land. And the conditional promise is, if you'll be obedient to the law that I give you, then you'll be my people. If, then, conditional clause, right? Then you'll be my people. I'll make you a kingdom of priests to the world around you. These are the very people that shout for the death of Jesus and fail, ultimately fail that condition of being obedient. They literally call for the death of the promised Messiah that God had promised to bring through them. And so God reiterates his promise to the nations afterwards that the promise is for you. If you're in Christ, this is for you, that he will carry you on wings of an eagle through the wilderness, this world, between the ascension and return, that he will provide for you, and he will make you a kingdom of priests, his kingdom, not this kingdom, a kingdom of priests, of mediators, of go-betweens, between a holy God and a sinful world, that you can become the messengers of the gospel. That you and I get the chance to be a part of that promise. Where others have failed, the church has that opportunity. And again, conditionally, in Christ, your salvation is secure, but your obedience takes your work. Your endurance takes effort. Your faithfulness to God means you've got to have your head in the game. So here's a note for you. Our problem is we treat the wilderness like home. Sadly, the American church today enjoys the wilderness more than the kingdom. We trade enduring and conquering this world for satisfaction in this earthly life. And we all have to just go, yeah, I'm totally guilty of that, right? Okay, just me and Lucky? All right. We all trade in the endurance and conquering of this life for the complacency and comfort and satisfaction here in this earthly life, right? We all do that. That is an American church issue, right? This is probably not true in the underground church in China, right? That is our issue because we're comfortable. He goes on, verse 15, the serpent poured out water like a river out of his mouth after the woman. So now Satan is pursuing the church on earth, right? To sweep her away with a flood. Again, big into kind of Egypt, that, that, re, that removal into the wilderness language, right? But the earth came to help the help of the woman and the earth opened up its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured out of his mouth. He's saying, listen, the, Satan is pursuing the church and he uses this language that's embedded in Israel's removal of Egypt and entering into the wilderness as they stood at the edge of the Red Sea and the Egyptian army chasing after them and they're looking at the Red Sea and they look at their leader Moses and they're like, what, there weren't enough graves in Egypt for us to die there? You had to bring us here to die? And then God parts the sea and they go across on dry land I heard someone the other day say, God didn't really part the sea. It was seasonal, and the water was really low, and they just went through. And I said, that's a greater miracle. How did God drown an entire Egyptian army in a puddle of water, right? 
Because after they get through, what happens? Egypt pursues them and the army dies in the Red Sea. Pick your miracle. Dividing the water, drowning an army in a puddle. I don't care. (laughs) Same God. And that's the language he's using here. That this pursuit like water, but the earth's going to swallow it up and protect the church on earth. Verse 17 Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her offspring. That's you, that's me. On those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. And every bit of me wanted to go into Revelation 13 today and pick this story up. We're going to pause here. No, I wanted to keep going. I know. We're not going to. I'm going to be disciplined, which never happens. We need to reshape our view here. Here's what the church needs to do. We need to reshape our view of who we are, where we are, and what we're called to. So young believers, you need a reshaping of the view of this life. Mature believers, and I don't care if you've been walking with Jesus for 80 years, you could be mature, immature, depending on where you are. Mature believers come in all shapes and sizes. But mature believers, you need to pass on what's important about this life and what's not. And those of you who are not yet believers need to hear that the call is not say this prayer and everything gets better. Everything is better. But it should get hard too. Like we should be enduring this in this world because this world is not our home and Satan lives here and evil lives here and sin lives here. Not just spiritual evil, but junk, all our junk lives here. And when you turn and go against that, it's not easy. And you endure here. The call is to overcome this world by the power of Christ in you. That you will live an eternity apart from that. And and again, eternity isn't based on your work. It's based on the work of Christ. But what I will tell you is if you're not turning, repenting, enduring, and living differently, my question is, are you in Christ? You can take that however you want to. But if you are not living in line with Jesus, the question is, are you in Christ? Either way, you can be in Christ. Repent and be baptized. That passage from Peter in Acts 2.38. So what must I do to be saved? All the people that just shouted for the death of Jesus asked, he says, repent and be baptized. Turn. Turn towards Jesus. Jesus. Obey Jesus. The first step of obedience is baptism. And the promise that comes with it is power to live for this life. Power to live in this life. And so the calling for all of us is repentance. The call of all of us is to to turn and to face Jesus and to endure this world. Will you pray with me? Jesus, we love you. You came and entered into this world. You came and and laid down everything that you rightfully should have, your throne and the glory of heaven. You laid it all down for us so you could come and rescue us. And you call us now for a temporary time, for a short time, though on certain days and certain years and certain months it'll feel like a long time, but it's a short time overall. You call us to lay ourselves down for you. You taught us in the Gospels that if we seek this life, we lose everything. If we seek you and we give up this life for you, we gain everything. Help us to remember that we are not citizens of this world. That we are citizens of a new kingdom that is yet to come, that is here and yet to come. That we live in the power of that kingdom now and will fully more see that forever but that you give us the power to overcome this world. And so, Jesus, we pray, will you teach us how to live that way? May we as a church, at Generations Family Church, may we learn how to live uniquely in this world. May we be a church, one local church, Lord, that is faithful to you. May we live as a light in this dark world. And may, may we bring hope to those in pain. May we bring hope to those in need. May we bring hope to one another when we struggle, Lord. 
It's because of you that we are here. If you had not laid down everything for us, we would not be here, but we are because you first loved us. So Jesus, it's in your name that we pray. Amen.